We have now reached the section in this teacher training video series about morphology. And this is a new and exciting area for me too. It is an area that I've known about for a number of years, but that I've been seeking as much training and development as I can in. And I've been learning some exciting things and I want to share them with you. This is also the section that will really transform not only how you teach reading and spelling, but how you teach vocabulary and how you teach content words to children and to students and how you help yourself learn new words. So let's just look at a few roots to begin with and begin to explore how roots play into English. Now remember, the phonograms describe the sounds of the language and the rules interact with those. But there's another level to words and that is morphemes. Morphemes are units of meaning within a word. And so if we know the phonograms, we'll have some hints about how a word is read and spelled. If we know the morphemes, we'll have insight into the meaning of words, even words that we may never have known or seen before. So let's begin with this root, the root tract. Can you think of some other words that have tract in them? And could you try to begin to figure out what tract might mean? So you might think of tractor or traction or extract, extraction. From these words, maybe you can figure out that tract means to pull. So the root tract means pull. And we can look at a few derivatives then and begin to see these words in a new light. So we have a tractor. A tractor is something that pulls. If we retract, me, re means back or again. So to retract means to pull back. Con, con means with or together. So to contract with someone means to pull together. So when we write a contract, we're pulling together with someone. And a contractor on a job site, his job or her job is to pull people together and get all the people from the different trades working together uh, in unison. So a contractor pulls people together. Extract, X means out. Think of the word exit. So Extract literally means to pull out. D means down, as in depress. So detract literally means to pull down. If you're anything like me, it's powerful to begin to see how knowing the meanings of the prefixes and the roots begin to bring new light to the meaning of these words. Let's look at another example. We have the word or the root, struct. Do you know what struct means? Maybe you can begin to think of some words that have struct in it. Structure, instruct, construction. Struct means you're right. It means to build. And here's a list of derivatives that you struct. Isn't it amazing how many words this shows up in? And let's look at just a few. We have the word destruct. D once again means down. So to destruct, or if something's destructive, it means to build down. Instruct, which we want to do with our students, means literally to build in. Ob means against. So to obstruct something means to build against it. I recently attended a presentation on morphology at the International Dyslexia Association. If you ever want to get some uh, insight into the latest research on language, it's a wonderful place to go. The uh, International Dyslexia Association, I think, is leading the world in research on the English language and how to teach it and on multisensory instru instruction. While I was there, one of the presenters put up this root. It says, sigh. Do you know what the root sigh means? I actually didn't either. And maybe you do, but I didn't. Um, but it's found in the words science and omniscience and conscience. It literally means knowledge. So science literally means knowledge. Omni means all, so omniscience means all-knowing. Con once again means with or together, so conscience means with knowledge. And that's really powerful. Here are uh, so a list of some of the words that use the root psi. And I was surprised to see that there were so many. Then the instructor put up on the screen the word prescient. This is sometimes also pronounced pronounced prescient. Uh, the dictionary shows it as both. 
Uh, and prescient, I thought, I have never seen this word before, but that's really cool. I know immediately what it means. And I believe you'll be able to see it too. Pre means before and uh, sci means knowledge. So this means before knowledge. Now, what's interesting in my experience of this word is that I read a lot. I read tremendous amounts of uh, books, classics, the news. I, I'm constantly reading and surrounded by literature. And I, for some reason, thought I had never seen this word before. And once I saw it in this presentation and saw its meaning, I have since read it in the news four times. This means that in my lifetime, I've certainly encountered this word probably hundreds of times, and I never gleaned its meaning from context. Usually we tell students that the tools they need to learn the meaning of a word are to figure it out from the context, and that's very helpful and it works. But if we know the roots, we have e additional cues as to what that word can mean. And sometimes the context is not enough, but knowing how the roots play together can help us tremendously. What's also fascinating to me is I've been sharing this in my presentations once again as I speak all over the United States. And you know, some people know the word, a vast majority of people don't. But I've started to get emails from people, and please don't send me any more, but I've started to get emails from people saying, I've seen the word prescient too. Knowing roots also helps us to teach words in context, and it's a powerful tool to help students figure out words that are unknown within a text. Let's take this quote from Aristotle. It is clearly better that property should be private, but the use of it common. And the special business of the legislator is to create in man this benevolent disposition. Now, some students might get to the word benevolent and go, I don't know what this means. And one strategy that you can teach students, rather than trying to figure it out just from context where Aristotle's words are pretty lofty and they might really wrestle with that, is to start thinking of other words that have the word or the root bene in them or related roots. So we can think of beneficial or benefit or benign or benefactor or benediction. And as you begin to think of these roots, you'll get the gist that benevolent means something good. So we're trying to create a good disposition in people. Teaching roots is also important when teaching content. Let's go to an elementary school math classroom. Many, many students struggle to remember how many quarts are there in a gallon. But if we simply draw a connection with other information, such as how many quarters are in a dollar, four. Uh, when I cut something in quarters, how many pieces do I cut it in? Four. If I listen to a quartet, how many musicians are there? There are four. If I get something quarterly, how often do I get it? Four. Therefore, quart means four, and there are four quarts in a gallon. How about in literature class? Students come across the word malicious. Someone is malicious and they don't know what it means. Well, they can begin to think of other words with mal in it. If something malfunctions, that's bad. If someone's malnourished, they're poorly nourished. If uh, something is malignant, it's bad, or a malady, or malice. And you can begin to discover that mal means bad. In fact, this also plays into a very popular book series, Harry Potter, because if you know anything about Malfoy, you know that he was bad. But you would have known that at the beginning of book one if you simply knew how to look at roots, and you would have had insight into that character. By the way, the Harry Potter series is full of roots and plays on words uh, and using roots in creative ways. Let's go to science class. Students are struggling to remember exothermic and endothermic. How can we help them remember which is which? First of all, we can teach them the root therm. What does therm mean? It means heat. And we can draw connections with other words they may already know. Thermal, thermometer, thermos, thermostat, all of these things have to do with heat. So exothermic and endothermic have something to do with heat. They don't need to rotely memorize this big word. In fact, these big science words are almost all Latin roots. And if you start to learn the meanings of the roots, you'll have trem a tremendous edge in the sciences. Then we can look at the prefix, ex. Ex, once again, means out, as an exit. We go out. Something that explodes moves outward. If we extend something, we 
put it out. And so when X means et, uh, out, we have insight into the fact that exothermic means that the heat is moving out. Then endo, on the other hand, means in. And we can teach students then that endo means in. This is not as common, but we can bring it into context in biology. Endoskeleton is a skeleton we have on the inside. This is in contrast to an exoskeleton, which is on the outside. And when we draw these connections, students have a lot less memory work to do, and they really begin to understand. Let's go to the history classroom. We have the Acropolis. Can you think of any words that use the root acro? Well, there's acrobat and acrophobia. Acro means height. So the Acropolis was on a high hill, and that was its actual, uh, why it was named that. Let's talk about prefixes for a few minutes because there's a little bit that I can teach you about prefixes that will be very, very helpful to you. First of all, whenever I teach a word um, in a classroom, I like to break out the morphemes. So we have pre, which means before. And then we have the root fix. Fix actually means attached. So a prefix are letters attached before a base that change the meaning. And you can see an example of the word fix being used as attached. Fix the stamp to the envelope. She fixed her eyes on him. So this would be a way that we can expand the student's vocabulary too in their understanding of the word fix. Now, when we're adding prefixes to words, I like to give students these word sums. And you could do this with a prefix. And so you could add the same prefix as you're learning its meaning to a variety of roots. And this will help students to understand how it changes the meanings of those roots. The nice thing about prefixes, at least all the English prefixes, is there's nothing special you need to know. You need to know the prefix, how it's spelled, and then you just put it on. And it's very simple. So let's look at this prefix, non. What does non mean? It means not. Now check this out. This is a list of uh, words that use the prefix non, and it only goes from A through F. And so you can imagine how many thousands of words there are that use the word non, or the prefix non. And you could create a lot of word sums this way, or vocabulary development activities, and really expand students' vocabulary by helping them understand the meanings of prefixes. Now, I want to give you a little insight into Latin prefixes, because this is an area that has a bit of confusion for a lot of people, but it's really not very hard. So here's the Latin prefix in. By the way, you can follow along in your teacher's training manual on page 169. So in the words indescribable, incomplete, and indivisible, what does the Latin prefix in mean? You're right, it means not. It means not um, describable and not complete, not divisible. Now, Latin prefixes sometimes have more than one form that they take on. Some people call these the chameleon prefixes. Uh, I don't usually have a special name for them, but I like to teach students how it works. So when we add the prefix in to illegal or to legal to make illegal or to literate to make illiterate or to legitimate to make illegitimate, what happens? Yeah, you'll notice that the N changes to an L. Now, this is because uh, the Latin language was very practical. If you try to say illegal, illegal, it's very hard because your tongue has to move forward. So that prefix changes to match the beginning letter of the root. Let's look at these. We have irresponsible, irregular, irrational. These all mean not. And the prefix changed to match the beginning of these roots with the er sound. We also have a word such as immobile and impossible. Why do you suppose in immobile it changes to a m sound? That's right, because it's before an m. How about in impossible? Why did it change to a m in impossible? You're right, because the m and the p are both said in the uh, in the lips, in the front of the mouth, and then to say impossible is fairly impossible. So the Latin prefixes change, so it eases pronunciation. Let's go on and talk about suffixes. Now a suffix uh, actually has the word fix in it as well, meaning attached, and then it has the prefix suff. 
Suff is actually one of these Latin prefixes that change. And it's originally the suffix sub, and it means below or beneath. So a suffix is a group of letters t attached below or beneath the root. And we can see, by the way, some examples of the prefix sub. So submarine is below the water. Fur actually means to carry. So to suffer means to carry under something. To surrender, rend means to tear, so to surrender means to tear under. Port uh, in support means to carry, so to support someone means to carry under them. So it becomes very powerful to see how the prefixes and, uh, play into the meanings of these words. I have now included on page 171 in your teacher's training manual five additional words for you to practice adding suffixes to using the suffix flowchart. The answers are also included on the page and I would encourage you to cover them up as you go through the questions and determine the answers.